let's start with a bit of honesty, shall we? <clears throat> I think we hopefully we're always honest, but let's start with a bit of honesty. Sin is a touchy subject. Even Christians struggle with this word sin. But the truth is, sin features on almost every page of the Bible. I suspect every page, but it features on almost every page, that's certain. Today's readings were no exception, were they? So yes, this is one of those sermons. I know what you're thinking. I'm glad I didn't bring any friends this morning. Yeah, or maybe you did. Maybe you're a visitor. Maybe you're with us this morning and now you're regretting it. I hope not. There are three typical responses when a preacher talks about sin. When a preacher talks about sin, we generally respond in one of three ways. The first way we respond is reflective. We reflect on our own choices, our own actions, our wants, our desires, our needs, and then we take it as an opportunity for improvement, for personal growth. The second way we often kind of start to receive when a preacher talks about sin is as a metaphor. We might respect the idea of sin, but we tend to view it as more of a metaphor for our actions, the things we do that harm others and ourselves, rather than some kind of breach of divine laws, something that separates us from a holy God and sends us into hell. Or we might talk about harm. We might see this sin as harm. Speaking of sins, guilt-inducing, isn't it? It's oppressive. It's pushing people down. It's a, it's a trigger word. We should focus on positive things, on daffodils and dandelions and all the good stuff around us, yeah? Rather than dwelling on the negatives. Well, all three of these are valid in the sense that they're our feelings and that's what we may feel and they're valid in that sense. But what I hope this morning is that we realise that all three views actually lead us into a place of oppression and not freedom. There is a fourth way. We're going to come to it, but you're going to have to stick around to the end to find out what that fourth way is. Let's pray. Open up God's Word. See where it takes us. Lord, we thank you for your great love. Open our hearts and minds to the words of Jesus this morning. Amen. First thing is we have sinner number one. This is in Matthew chapter nine, verse one. Sinner number one, Jesus stepped into a boat. I used a slightly different translation to Harry, so you'll swat a few different words, but it's the same, same Bible. Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. This guy, he was paralysed, his situation was tragic, his need could not be more obvious, his need could not be more pressing, yet this is not what Jesus addresses first, is it? The obvious problem, he's a paralytic, he's on a mat, was not what Jesus speaks to first. The first thing he says is, your sins are forgiven. If we held this reflective view of sin, this metaphorical view or this harm view, we'd never be able to sense what Jesus is doing here. The most pressing need was the forgiveness of sin. Let me ask a hypothetical question. What do you suppose this man would choose if Jesus gave him an option? I'll forgive your sins or make you walk. Which do you suppose he would choose? Actually, let's make it more personal. What would we choose if we were on the mat and Jesus gave us the choice? I'll forgive your sin or I'll heal your legs. Which would we choose? Yeah, I reckon I'd choose a physical healing too. I reckon I would, which means I'm possibly starting to see sin as a matter of reflection, metaphor, or harm. See, all three views are, are, are our attempt to control, manipulate, or change the optics of sin in our lives. Jesus just cuts through all of this and he just speaks, your sins are forgiven. It's a concrete response to a concrete problem. Still, thanks Jesus, what about my legs? Well, he gets to that too. It's important still, but it's not the greatest need. At verse three, Jesus, at the forgiveness of the sins, I should say, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blasphemy. Heal his illness, good on you, Jesus. 
but forgive his sins? You are the devil of hell, these leaders say. We know what happens next. Jesus smashes these religious hypocrites and the crowd goes wild. Now, I used to look at this story and kind of think it, it was to show up these religious phonies, those pretending to work for God when really they don't. They're really working for themselves. I thought it was about them. But when I read it this week, that's not what I saw at all. I saw it as the, I saw it as the purpose of this was to show us that sin is real, that to be healed of sin, to have our sin dealt with, is actually our most important need. Let me, let, me, let me say this. I, for one, am guilty for praying my heart out to see somebody healed of something they're going through. So often I find myself just, come on, God, heal in the name of Jesus over and over again. For someone I know who's hurting, I love them. They're part of our church. They're part of our friendship family. And I really focus on that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But how often do I focus on seeing my sin forgiven or praying for their sin to be forgiven. That was Jesus' first focus, but it's rarely, if ever, mine. Let's move on because we've got a second sinner here to get through quickly. This is Matthew 9, verse 9. This is the second sinner in today's passage. And it says this, As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up, followed him. There's no indication here that Matthew thought he was a sinner. We assume that he does, and that's often what preachers focus on. Matthew, the tax collector, being a sinner. He's, a, he's hated by his people. He's taking money from his friends and his family and giving it to Rome. He's despised by them. So therefore, he, he must know that he is a sinner. But I'm not so sure. I suspect, I suspect Matthew might see sin as, a, as reflection. He knows he's not perfect, but he's going to keep working on it. Perhaps that's how Matthew sees sin. He knows he's not perfect, but he's, he's going to keep working on it. Perhaps Matthew looks at sin as a bit of a metaphor. Taxes have to be collected. It's right to give taxes to the, to the ruling government, so I'm just doing my job. No sin here. Or perhaps he just sees sin as harm, like, don't talk about it. Somebody might get offended. Let's just put that under the rug and move on. So why does he choose to follow Jesus then? Why does he choose to follow Jesus? He has no physical needs, no indication of a physical need, no indication that he has a need to be forgiven of sin, at least in his own eyes. So why? Well, we don't really know. But when I look at Matthew and his story, what I see is someone in need of, of family. I see someone who's in need of acceptance, someone who desperately wants to be part of the community he grew up in, someone who desperately needs to be loved and not the superficial kind of love that his rich tax collector friends would have offered, but really loved and accepted. That's what I see when I look at Matthew. Matthew. And if you've come to church for these reasons, you are most welcome here. If we are truly a gathering of Christ's followers, then you will find these things here. But it's not your greatest need. Your greatest need is the forgiveness of sin. This truth is made clear by Jesus' response. A response to the religious phonies, the scribes, the Pharisees, who were too gutless to address Jesus, so they spoke to his followers spoke in the side rooms and they said this in verse 11. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And here we have an extreme. Focus too much on the sin. There is no love, no acceptance. Focus too much on the sin. There's no family, there's no church. And to this extreme, Jesus responds. It's not the healthy who need a doctor but those who are ill. The church is a hospital for sinners. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I've come not to call the righteous, that's those who think they are not sinners, but I've come to call sinners. At one extreme, we have people focusing on their present needs. The paralytic man, 
Matthew in need of love. That's one extreme. Instead of focusing on the sin that separates them from God. On the other, we have people focusing on sin and they're missing the community, the love. They're missing the mercy of God. Both fail to see who Jesus really is. Like the woman at the well, the story we all know well, they fail to see Jesus who is the one who gives living water. Drink what Jesus has to offer and you will never be thirsty again. That's what he says to the woman at the well. That's what he says to us. But what about the fasting and the garment, the ruined garment? Let's have a look at that too. This is in verse 14. John's disciples came and asked him, that's John the Baptist's disciples, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? Well, John the Baptist is still alive at this point. He's in prison. He's arrested, isn't he, for speaking against Herod, but he is alive. And then his followers have come and asked Jesus this question. It's a bit competitive. It's almost as if they're on the side of the Pharisees, the scribes, isn't it? They're on their side. So what's going on here? Why are they getting this wrong? Why don't they understand Jesus? I mean, their leader said that Jesus was the one, that he was preparing the way for Jesus, that he was unworthy to even tie his sandals. What are they getting wrong? They're getting sin wrong, of course. I reckon they ask this because they see sin as merely an opportunity for reflection, an opportunity for moral growth. And while we're on the topic, how did our Pharisees, our subscribes, how are they looking at this problem of sin? I think they see it as a metaphor. I mean, I know they, they consider themselves obedient to God's law. That's what they were all about, wasn't it? They were the legalists. They saw sin as disobedience from God. But who wrote the rules that they are trying to enforce others to obey? Sure, they read the Ten Commandments. They've got the scriptures, but most of what they do is from the Talmud. It's additional work made by humans in order to oppress, ultimately. And that's what Jesus was fighting. Anyway, Jesus answers them, doesn't he? He never mucks around. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? A time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast. Jesus' response is deeply cultural, deeply contextual. And on one level, it's, it's a matter of respect to John's followers. He didn't want to rebuke them, I imagine. He wanted to kind of, I mean, they were doing their best with what they had and he was just respecting them. I mean, John's in prison. So his followers should be mourning. They should be fasting. But Jesus is not yet in prison. But their time will come. And then he says this in verse 16. No one sews a patch of untrunk cloth on an old garment for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both are preserved. Two clear metaphors, two ways something new cannot be integrated with something old. The patch is clear, Cloth was very, clothing was very stiff, but as it had been worn, it started to stretch. And if you stuck a new cloth on there and sewed it on, and when you moved, the cloth wouldn't stretch, but the clothing around it would, and it would tear. I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward. The wine skins, again, the wine skin was a sheep stomach. They would clean it out, obviously, but that's what they stored their wine in. Um, that way, when it, when it, when it fermented, the, the stomach would stretch, but as the, the stomach got older, it would lose its stretch. And if you put new wine in there, well, then it would burst. So fairly straightforward metaphors. Well, in the same way, we need to become completely new in Jesus. He is the new wine or the new patch. If we just take a little bit of his teachings, if we just pick and match just a little bit of Jesus, and then we try to integrate it into our own worldview, into our version of morality, well, at best, it will fail like the patch and we'll just go back to our old ways. But at the worst, this attempt to integrate Jesus with our worldview, well, it's going to tear us apart, isn't it? It's going to burst like the sheep's stomach. And I know how some of us feel. We, we often feel this pulling and 
temptation to go back to our old ways. Do you think I don't miss the money of owning a telecommunications company? Do you think I don't miss that? Of course I do. There's always a temptation to go back to our old ways. Perhaps the Spirit's saying to you this morning, jump in with both feet. That's what I hope. Jump in with both feet. Stop trying to keep a foot in both camps because you'll be torn apart. It's a bit like that kid's song, isn't it? You've got to put your whole self in, turn yourself around. Yeah. Let me wrap this up. Most people see sin in one of three lights. Reflective. Sadly, this view, that in this view, when we look at sin as a matter of simple reflection, it tends to make this whole topic just self-help. A lot of churches go down that path where sin just becomes, all these teachings just become a matter of self-help. But at the heart of this idea that sin is just merely a matter for reflection is a legalism. It's a legalism that puts us in danger of mistaking or... It puts us in danger of mistaking our increased piety, at least visible piety. That's our kind of our good behaviour. If we see sin as reflection, some of us are just good at being good, yeah? I was brought up in a good family. I had a good upbringing. I can, I'm just good at being good. And it's so easy, we do that with sin. We're just good at being good. We can mistake that as a blessing from God as something Jesus is doing in us, when actually it's just a good upbringing. That would be a mistake. The second thing we see as sin as is a metaphor. If we see sin as a metaphor for just the actions that harm and hurt other people or ourselves, well, I can tell you without a doubt, this is the most common view. When I knock on doors here in Stockton and beyond, everywhere I have been, I just simply ask people, what does sin mean to you? And I reckon... I won't even, it's more than nine out of 10. It's more like 49 out of 50. I won't say it's 99 out of 100, but you know what I mean? Like almost every single person answers me. Sin is something I, my conscience tells me is wrong. That's the answer. They see sin as a metaphor. Now, sadly, if we see sin as a metaphor for wrongdoing, if we unanchor sin from the divine law of a holy God, then my friends, we are on a slippery slope to all manner of evil. That's what it looks like. That's what happens. Does anyone think for a moment that Putin thinks his actions are wrong, bad or evil? Of course he doesn't. Thinks he's entirely justified. He sees sin as a metaphor. What about, what about the laws they're pushing for at the moment to leave uh, failed aborted babies? Where the abortions failed, the baby's still alive and they're passing laws to keep them on the bench while they die. The people pushing for those laws do not believe they are immoral, unjustified or evil, I can tell you without a doubt. There is so much in our culture today that, would, that I would, and I think rightly, label as evil, but few see it as wrong. When we see sin as a metaphor, it leaves our actions relative leaves our actions comparative. We only need to be better than our next door neighbour. We just need to be a little bit better than our parents or our friends and our neighbours and then heaven's arms are open wide for us, yeah? That's what sin as a metaphor does. And thirdly, we had sin as harm. Now, of course, we must be compassionate we must remove the plank from our own eyes. I often preach from the difficult things in my own life. All I've got are the valleys. All I've got are the valleys when I'm talking about this topic, this subject. We must put on a lens of love if we're going to address the topic of sin. But to see it as harm, to see correction as harm, well, this prevents change, it prevents growth. It's well and truly sticking our head in the sand. And the worst bit about this idea is that it makes us unable to help anyone, even ourselves. But what about that new wine? That's what we're here for this morning. What about that fourth way? The way we can receive the knowledge that we are all sinners. 
How can we receive this truth that we all fall short of the glory of God? This fourth way, it's freedom. I dropped that at the start by accident. I was trying to hold that word to the end. But the fourth way is freedom. Freedom from sin is our greatest need. The purpose of life, our primary objective, if you will, is to be free from the consequences, the eternal consequences of sin. And the only way this can be found is in Jesus. This is why the Bible bangs on about it so much. Let me just give three quick examples. John chapter one, verse nine. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 15, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. I don't talk about sin to oppress, I don't talk about sin to mislead or judge. I talk about it so that we may have freedom, so we may have life to the full quote Jesus. I talk about it because the cornerstone of a life that looks forward to heaven, to an eternity in the presence of perfect love and justice is a person who has received the forgiveness that is in Christ. That's what happened to our paralyzed man. That's what happened to Matthew. They both encountered Jesus. Matthew got a family. The paralyzed man could walk, but that was just the sideshow. The main event today was that they received forgiveness of sin. The heart of sin is a separation from God. To have that sin forgiven, to restore us to God, that's why this all matters. And out of this flows freedom. Last, last, lastly, I saw this great skit on YouTube the other day just popped up, I can't remember why, probably just doom scrolling or something as they call. And um, (laughs) this really average looking guy introduces his new girlfriend to his mates. And he's really average looking, but she's like a supermodel. She's like this much taller than him. You know, all the picture of Barbie you would imagine. And his his friends, oh, this is my new girlfriend. His friends are like, no. And this is my new girlfriend. They're just like, they wouldn't believe it. They wouldn't believe that this was his girlfriend. She's like, no, no, we're, we're going out. And they're like, <laughs> it was hilarious. And you're just watching this view and it's, it's like this. No one will believe you are one of God's if you attempt to stand beside him full of sin. It's the same thing. They will see you and go, no, no, this picture does not work. It cannot work can't stand beside God with a cup full of sin. The solution is Jesus. You know this, every word of our service is about this. And we're gonna continue it this morning as we come to the Lord's Supper. That is the reminder that Jesus died for us, that we have freedom in Him, that our sin is dealt with and the cup is empty. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great love. Thank you that you stand between death and hell and you say stop. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you pull us into the kingdom of God, enabling us to stand beside the Father in full righteousness with a cup emptied of sin. In Jesus' name, amen.